Welcome to Content Protection from IET Media. IET Media is the Institute of Engineering and Technologies technical network for engineers involved in all forms of media. Our presenter today is Graham Turner. Graham has worked in the pay and digital television industry since the late 1980s. In 1991, he co-founded Farncom Technology, a specialist digital and pay television consultancy that has carried out security audits on the majority of television conditional access systems. Graham's also been extensively involved in helping broadcasters fight the piracy of their systems subsequent to deployment. Following a spell as a vice president with NAGRA and two high profile cases where he acted as an expert witness in the High Court, he spent three years as chair of the IET's media network. Well, hello. I'm pleased that you're able to join me for this uh, session on content protection. Uh, content protection as we know it today has been around for about 30 years. For as long as there's been pay content on television or being delivered uh, to people's homes in some way, there's been a desire to protect that content. But protection as we know it today and as we'll be looking at it uh, in this uh, webinar really only started to appear about 30 years ago when digital uh, audio and then digital video started to appear. Before that, protection involved various uh, crude techniques in the way of uh, frequency traps or other things that tried to protect uh, people from getting unauthorized access to cable networks. But in this uh, webinar, we'll be looking at the modern technology that's replaced all of that uh, and has introduced uh, cryptography as the backbone of protecting content. So looking at what we'll be covering in this webinar. First of all, we'll be looking at how we encrypt and decrypt content, how conditional access systems work to provide uh, the protection, to provide a way of actually delivering that content uh, and charging viewers for that content, and then looking at what can go wrong, what are the issues to do with piracy. In a bit more detail, uh, we'll be looking first of all at some of the basics of cryptography, an overview of how a pay TV system is configured and how it works, set-top box architecture, whether that's on using hardware security, software or cardless systems, which have become very much uh, more popular these days, uh, and the use of common interface modules or other forms of separable security. We'll be looking at how that affects interoperability, ways of fingerprinting and watermarking content to try and protect it further, what piracy has done uh, and what piracy has taught us uh, in the way of things that can go wrong, uh, leading into lessons really to be learnt uh, in all of this area. My own background uh, has been from the early days of uh, cryptographic content protection from British satellite broadcasting uh, through to the present day. And a lot of what we've learnt in pay television security issues can really be applied to Internet of Things and more generally to cyber security these days. So it's all quite uh, relevant to a lot lots of things uh, that are impacting on technology and people's homes at the present time. But really we're looking at broadcast in this case, broadcast uh, protecting content going over satellite, terrestrial or cable networks. And the reasons for protecting the content are really all to do with money, as I mentioned previously. Linear television, there are subscriptions or pay-per-view, and here we have satellite, terrestrial, cable, going across DSL, 4G or 5G uh, networks. Linear content, there may be a requirement for geographic restriction. At one time, for instance, the BBC didn't necessarily have the rights to transmit content in the whole of the United Kingdom. So they wanted at one time to protect content for, for Scotland, for say, for being viewed in England. There may be a requirement to have set-top box control. Some countries such as South Africa have subsidized the delivery of set-top boxes to viewers and they don't want those boxes to be used in other territories uh, so that their subsidy is leaching out uh, and being used to finance other broadcasters' operations. There are on-demand services, subscription and transactional video on demand. Over-the-top content, very much what we're seeing these days with Netflix and uh, Disney and uh, Amazon services. And the devices that this content's going to range from set-top box, the traditional target market, through smartphones and tablets, smart televisions, and although they're getting rather elderly and long in the tooth as a concept, computers, and all of the time the issue is to maintain the revenue uh, and keep rights holders happy because ultimately the broadcasters won't be able to get the rights from the studios if they can't actually protect the content uh, from being pirated and viewed 
uh, in other parts uh, without uh, revenue going back to the rights holders. So what are the issues at stake? Well, it's a big business and piracy can lose broadcasters many tens or hundreds or even billions of dollars. Some recent uh, information, there was a, in 2017, a comment that the screen, uh, that the piracy in France fell, but still cost over a billion euros. Uh, and in fact, a, a very recent bit of information from uh, uh, an email I received um, in the, literally today suggested that worldwide uh, losses could be viewed as high as $52 billion uh, across primarily a leading number of countries where piracy occurs, one of which is the United Kingdom. It's an interesting question as to whether these figures are really meaningful because losses suggest are based on the idea that a pirate viewer would actually be a subscribing viewer if they weren't a pirate, and that's not at all uh, the case. Nevertheless, there are very substantial amounts of money involved. So we're looking at the technology which is used to protect content from illegal access. Conditional access, traditionally used to protect pay TV broadcasters, set-top boxes, but now being used uh, in some other uh, to some other devices as well as set-top boxes or digital rights management protecting content to phones tablets pcs and so on uh, in this webinar we'll primarily be looking at conditional access technology or some of the issues that we'll uh, see relate equally to drm or any other method uh, of protecting content so what are the fundamentals of what we need to do first of all we've got to encrypt or encipher or scramble to take the old analog television term the content before delivery. So we get the digital content, we choose an encryption algorithm, we select a key, and using that algorithm together with the key, we encrypt the content. So now we've got the content locked down. To get at it and allow the viewer to watch it, we need to decrypt it, to decipher it. So we need to get the decryption key. Now getting this to the set-top box or whatever the reception device is securely can be quite difficult. And this is one of the major issues uh, that uh, CA systems have to tackle. But then the decryption key and the appropriate decryption algorithm uh, are used to decrypt the content and get it back in the clear so it can be viewed. Symmetric cryptography uses the same key for encryption and decryption. With asymmetric cryptography, the encryption key and the decryption key are different. We'll be looking a little bit more at those uh, in a moment. So going back to the old analog terminology, scramble, then descramble. So although it's all digital these days, you'll often hear people still referring to scrambling content uh, and descrambling it. So symmetric and asymmetric cryptography. There are a variety of algorithms which may be used. Uh, a lot of the early content protection in the US used the data encryption standard, DES, with 56-bit keys. These days, uh, the advanced encryption standard is now the new US standard with keys up to 256 bits in length. The DVB original common scrambling algorithm used 64-bit keys, and the new CSA3, there are 128-bit keys. And the reason that people use symmetric cryptography is because the algorithms are fast. But the difficulty is that all the keys have to be kept secret. If the key leaks out, uh, then anybody can access the content. So here's an example of the use of symmetric cryptography. So uh, Alice wants to uh, uh, send uh, a message to Bob. We've got the message, hi, Bob, Alice. We encrypt it. C is the ciphertext encrypted using the encryption function, uh, E. M is the, the plain text message. K is the key that's being used. We end up with some sort of what appears to be totally random uh, and with a perfect encryption algorithm, it will would be fully random. Uh, what appears to be random data being transmitted the ciphertext. So anyone uh, listening to that is unable to uh, to understand what it means. We have to get the set shared secret key across to the other side. So that's one of the issues. So both A and B know the secret key. And then at the other side, the message, the plain text, can be obtained by decrypting the encrypted the ciphertext uh, using the, the same key. With asymmetric or public cryptography, uh, of us often referred to as the Reves Shamir Edelman algorithm, R RSA, the keys can be up to these days up to typically 4,096 bits in length. Computation and execution is slow, but the great thing is you can publish the public key, which is used for encryption, so anybody can encrypt content to send to 
a known recipient, but only that recipient has the secret key and only they can decrypt it. So in that case, we can have a message which is encrypted using a public key. Again, we have random data, but only the person holding the secret key is able to decrypt it. So the great advantage there is that we don't actually have to keep the public key secret. So at the end, we're encrypting, we can allow that key to be known uh, and it doesn't actually compromise the security of the system. We'll look at a little example just to show the way uh, encryption works. Very simple in this case. Ciphers can work either on data streams or blocks of data. And in this case, we'll take a really simple example with a four bit block. For our encryption algorithm, again, we'll use a really trivial algorithm. Although, having said that, this was the algorithm used, uh, in fact, eventually in the, uh, uh, the MAC services to exclusive OR uh, between the key and the plain text. So with the exclusive OR, if we exclusive OR 0 and 0, or zero, 1 and 1, together we get 0. Exclusive OR 0 and 1, or 1 and 0, we get 1. So each time we'll perform an exclusive OR between each plain text bit and a bit from the key, then we'll rotate the key one bit and carry on. So here's the input stream. We can see the key stream at the top there, initialized with 1, 0, 1, 1. Here's the input plain text stream in the middle. So the first four bits of the plain text are 0, 1, 0, 1. And if we exclusive OR each of those bits together, we'll see 1 exclusive OR 0 gives us a 1, 0 exclusive OR 1, 1, another 1, then 0. Then we go on to the next block of four bits. The key is uh, rotated one bit left, so the 1, 0, 1, 1 becomes 0, 1, 1, 1, the exclusive OR again. And so block by block, four bits by four bits, we end up with our ciphertext output stream. To decrypt it, all we need to do is exclusive all the encrypted data together with the key to get back the plain text. So here is the uh, key stream initialized with uh, 1011. Input ciphertext stream. If we exclusive all the ciphertext and the key stream together, we get one exclusive all one zero, zero exclusive all one one, and so on. And you can see the plain text output stream at the bottom is the same as the plain text input stream that we had above. So it works successfully. We've put in our input stream, we've encrypted it using our rather simple algorithm and our key, we've decrypted it using the algorithm and key, and we come back to the same plain text stream. Well, that was very simple with a four bit key. And obviously, uh, in practice, keys are nothing like that simple, or it'd be very easy to just try all the combinations and break the system. So we need to think about what do you need to do to protect against uh, brute force attacks? So with a symmetric key, uh, a pirate might decide to actually try every value in turn. And on average, once they got through half the possible values, they would have found the key. Well, let's assume an attacker needs a microsecond to test each value. The keys found on average after half have been tried. With a 56-bit key, like DES, there are two to the 56 possible values, about seven times 10 to the 16 possible values. So a brute force attack would take about a thousand years, or if we had a thousand coordinated attacks in parallel by taking a thousand PCs, say, eight hours, uh, or one year, sorry, eight hours if we had a million devices in parallel. But implementation or use errors may produce dramatic shortcuts. This is one of the things about DES. There are ways to shortcut uh, and get through DES without having to try as many brute force attacks as we might calculate here. But even so, they're very large amounts of computation, a lot of effort needed. And the aim with protecting pay television is really not to, it's not like protecting military secrets, it's trying to protect from commercial exploitation and commercial piracy of the content. With asymmetric key, the public key is known, and to break the system, uh, to attack it, the attacker has to factor a large public number the public key as the product of two large primes and this is very difficult computationally. Originally 1024 bit keys were used but as computing power has got better it's now easier to factor 1024 bit keys uh, and so there's a move to uh, really 2000 or 4096 bit keys. But the problem with using these longer key lengths is there's a lot more processing power uh, and time needed for the valid user. So wherever possible, the algorithms will tend to use symmetric cryptography where they can and restrict themselves to asymmetric only for um, very high value bits of content or very high value items of information. We'll look now at a 
pay television system as a quick overview. And we'll come back to this and look in a bit more detail later on. So don't worry if it uh, doesn't seem uh, as straightforward at the moment, uh, the first time through, we will be looking at this uh, a bit later on. So what we've got in the way of the major blocks at the broadcaster environment end, the first thing is we have a subscriber management system uh, with a subscriber database and the subscriber interacts with that via a call center or online. Historically, it would have been a call center, these days very much more online. Then the subscriber management system talks to a subscriber authorization system, which is the uh, much of the heart of the conditional access system. That has a database of, sus of subscriber authorization where it relates the subscriber authorizations to the way in which those authorizations are delivered. So in fact, in that case, a subscriber ID will be matched to a list of entitlements, for instance, that might be held in a smart card. Uh, at the viewer's uh, um, home. There's a message generator that's going to produce the over-air messages to talk to uh, the equipment in the viewer's home. And there's a control word generator. Historically, this used to be within the conditional access system, but as we'll see later on, it's now moved out to be a standalone item, a control word generator, the control word being the lowest level key that's used for actually scrambling or encrypting uh, the content stream. We have a multiplexer, and into that, and then we've got the video, audio, and data streams that we want to deliver to the viewer. And that's multiplexed together with the conditional access data of EMMs, the management messages, and ECMs, the control messages. And again, we'll look at these in more data in more detail a bit later. Uh, these are multiplexed together, and then they that transport stream is then encrypted in the scrambler or encryptor, delivered over satellite, cable, or terrestrial to the viewer's home, to a set-top box with a conditional access subsystem inside the set-top box, and then rendered on the subscriber's viewing device, television or whatever else it may be. So the data that's actually going out, that transport stream that's going out, uh, we've got an illustration here. At the top, you can see um, the two periods for different control words. That's the stream of data running along the top. Control word one period, control word two period. And what we've got inside that transport stream is the various encrypted video, audio, and data. In our terminology, we'll have M for the plain text, the unencrypted video, audio, and data, the media, and the control words, I say, are the lowest level keys used for transport stream encryption. So our encrypted video, CVID, in the same terminology as we had for our illustration for the uh, symmetric cryptography previously, we've got encryption algorithm E1, acting on the plain text media using the key control word one during the first time period and in the second time period we've got the same encryption algorithm e1 being used on the plain text data together with control word two these are often referred to as current and next period and so as the control as the transport stream is delivered to the subscriber uh, we have blocks of data successively encrypted using different control words. First of all, control word one, control word two, control word three, and so on. For DVB, the encryption algorithm is the DVB common scrambling algorithm. For ATSC in the United States, it's the advanced encryption algorithm, the advanced encryption. And the control word periods are typically in the range of one to 10 seconds, although some systems can work with control words shorter than that, and historically, uh, some content was delivered with much longer control words. However, that's uh, rather frowned on these days because it makes life easier for pirates to, uh, to actually access content. The ECM, the entitlement control message or checking message delivers the control word data. So inside that message, uh, we've got encrypted using encryption algorithm E2, we've got the entitlement that's needed in order to access that content. So that might be, if it's a bitmap, it might show that bit two is set to show that uh, you need to have bit two set in your entitlement vector inside the smart card to enable you to watch the content. And together with that, it also delivers the control word for the current and the next period. And that's all encrypted under a key referred to as the service or operation key. In the next control word period, uh, we have the same information on the entitlement needed, but then we have control word two, control word three. So each time in each ECM, we have the information on the entitlement that's needed and the current and the next control word. So it's always possible to acquire content as long as the receiver has the operational service key to decrypt the ECMs. The EMMs, the management messages, are one level higher up. 
uh, and using encryption algorithm E3, uh, they give the entitlements to the smart card or whatever the device is in the viewer's home, and they uh, pr also provide the service key for the current uh, Peer, subscription period and for the next subscription period. So typically these will be monthly subscriptions. So the entitlements will be given together with the keys needed to access uh, the ECMs for the current and the next month. And all of those are delivered encrypted using either a unique key to that particular uh, smart card or set-top box or a group key that may be shared between say 256 uh, of them. Whereas we have a common scrambling algorithm, either DVB, CSA or AES for uh, the actual uh, transport stream. Uh, for the ECMs and the EMMs, uh, these can be uh, encrypted using whatever uh, algorithm the CA manufacturer wants to, to use. Often the algorithm for both the ECMs and the EMMs is the same, for simplicity, uh, and it's quite proprietary. It doesn't have to be the same between different manufacturers. So what's in the ECM? So it's an entitlement checking or control message. It identifies the entitlement that's required to access the content. This may be a subscription or pay-per-view or transactional video on demand event. It contains the two control words or data from which the control words can be obtained for the current and the next control word period. It's repeated frequently to allow rapid access to content. So for instance, ECMs might be repeated four times a second or more frequently. Uh, because when you first or when the box first accesses a transport stream, it can't even begin to decrypt the content until it's received an ECM uh, and can access the uh, control words in order to begin decrypting the content. So, if we repeat that every four times a second, it means on average uh, there's uh, an eighth of a second delay before the first ECM is obtained uh, and we can start to begin the decryption process. It's broadcast to all receivers. It doesn't really matter whether you have the entitlement or not because the secure hardware, the secure device inside the receiver will decide whether it should decrypt it or not. It's encrypted using a symmetric algorithm chosen by the CA vendor, as I said before, and compatibility between CA systems is not required. Uh, so if you were to look at, say, a system from one vendor and a system from another vendor, although the concepts are the same, the actual algorithms will be quite different. The ECM is encrypted using a common key held by all the valid receivers referred to as either the service or the operation key, depending on which CA vendor you're talking to. And the service or operation key are normally updated on a monthly basis uh, in many cases. Some of the early systems, the keys weren't updated uh, and smart cards were based on EEPROM rather than E-squared PROM, so they, uh, they had limited ability to change the data within them. Uh, and not changing the key was one of the ways in which uh, systems could expose themselves to uh, piracy. The EMM, the, the next level up, is the management message. This delivers the entitlements to the CA element of the receiver, again for subscriptions or individual events, provides the current and next period values of the service keys, and this allows the CA element in the receiver to decrypt the ECMs. It's usually encrypted under a symmetric algorithm, as I said before, often the same as for ECMs, uh, using either a unique key, unique to that receiver or smart card, or a group or shared key common to a small group, or in some cases, a slightly larger group. Uh, the message is broadcast, but contains in the clear address information, either for a unique receiver or group of receivers. And other information can also be delivered uh, in the EMM, such as new, uh, unique or group keys, and sometimes other management information, if there's a desire to deliver things like pins or locations in a secure way, that can be done inside the EMMs. But a lot of this has moved out of the EMM now uh, into some of the other signaling data within uh, DVB services, but there's still the ability to put it into the EMM if the broadcaster or CA vendor wishes. We mentioned DVB, so looking at how DVB manages CA data, the DVB packets are MPEG packets carrying all of the content and data. The CA data is part of the service information. And the DVB uh, standard defines packets, packet IDs, and, uh, to uh, provide the information. So the CA table is in a, a packet with packet ID uh, hex 0001. And within that uh, CA table, there's private data, which includes pointers to where EMMs can be found. So giving the uh, packet IDs of the EMMs. The program association table, uh, which is at address zero, contains pointers to program map tables. And the program map tables point to the streams that make up a service. 
So for a particular service, there will be a typically uh, a video stream, one or more audio streams, perhaps multiple languages. There may be other data streams for subtitles uh, and other information, and there are also uh, an e ECM stream associated with that. So the program map table will contain pointers to all of those elements. So coming back now, as I promised to uh, our uh, CA system, let's see about how we set up a subscription in the first place. And then we'll look at how the, the viewer actually views content. So to set up a subscription, the subscriber calls in or contacts the uh, call center and requests uh, an entitlement, say for um, a particular uh, uh, movie service. That's recorded in the database, subscriber database on the SMS. A message goes across to the SAS giving the information about the particular entitlement that's to be granted. So this entitlement database in the SAS, the subscriber authorization system, holds that information and generates an EMM in its message generator, an EMM saying, here is the entitlement for this particular service. That EMM goes into the multiplexer, goes into the transport stream, uh, and is then encrypted using the keys from the control word generator. Uh, and uh, that, um, so, so the video and audio is encrypted. The EMM has been encrypted under the proprietary algorithm is in the, uh, the transport stream. At the set-top box end, the conditional access subsystem filters out the EMM that's in intended for it because it knows its own address. It looks at the address in the header of the uh, EMM information, sees which EMM is entitled, uh, intended for it, extracts that EMM, gets out the entitlement from that and loads it into its own secure database because the conditional access system is, at the subscriber end has been preloaded with a number of management and sometimes operational keys so it will begin to work as soon as it's in the viewer's home. So the entitlement's now there in the box. And then when that particular, uh, when the viewer wants to access that content, uh, it's been encrypted using the control words. At the, at the set-top box end, uh, the ECMs can now be accessed because the information's been obtained on how to decrypt and the service or operational key's been obtained from the EMM. The set-top box, the conditional access subsystem in it can decrypt uh, the uh, uh, transport stream it can obtain the the video and audio and deliver it to the uh, the viewer to watch so we've got a two-stage process first of all delivering the messages uh, to provide the entitlements and the keys in the subscribers subsystem uh, and then uh, actually the system can access the content because all of the information needed to decrypt uh, the content stream is actually then present in the set-top box well, types of entitlement, we've talked about subscriptions, and these are usually on a monthly basis. There may be pay-per-view, which supports broadcast content, perhaps with some very high-value items. So if you're watching a particular boxing match, a football match, that may be outside the normal subscription and require an additional payment. Pay-per-view may be either pre-purchase, where the set-top box contacts the central systems in some way, makes a purchase, and then receives an EMM granting the entitlement. Or it could be store and forward, where uh, a value of um, credit is loaded into the conditional access subsystem. The ECM alongside the pay-per-view event indicates the cost of the item. The purchase is made locally, decrementing the credit held in the set-top box, and every now and then the box contacts the central systems, in many cases monthly, to report purchases. This was a very popular way of doing it before uh, broadband became so widely uh, available and easy to use. Uh, in the old days of these systems, the report back would have been typically with a dial-up system, which is why it tended to be monthly, uh, as online continuous contact has become much more easy. There's been a move towards uh, actual handshaking by the top uh, one, where the transaction is uh, requested and immediately granted, as opposed to something that's carried out online. But there are still some online systems, in, uh, some offline systems in use uh, with periodic reporting back. Video on demand, uh, essentially unicast, but in fact, this is a very inefficient way, of course, of using broadcast facilities. So where broadcasters have wanted to deliver uh, a pseudo video on demand service, they've often gone to uh, what's been referred to as near video on demand, uh, where the same content may be transmitted, perhaps starting a on a number of streams, starting at say 15 minute intervals. So it behaves a bit like video on demand, but it's not actually a true video on demand. But for purchasing the, the VOD, again, it's very much like a pre-purchase of a pay-per-view. 
uh, but of course if it's only going to one device the EMM needn't be broadcast but could be delivered across a IP link specifically to that just just that one conditional access subsystem. In delivering those entitlements they can either be positive in addressing so the entitlement has a limited duration associated with it so unless it's renewed it expires so even if you stop the conditional access subsystem from receiving any more EMMs the entitlement will expire and in many cases the expiry date is tied to the service key period so monthly so this is a very simple sort of system and it means that one of the simpler ways you might try and attack it by preventing uh, the system from getting turn off messages can't apply because actually it will automatically expire so whatever happens the authorization will be lost to keep messaging down some of the early systems use negative addressing uh, entitlement doesn't have any duration associated with it so it becomes it's essentially an infinite length entitlement and it only ends when a message is received removing the entitlement and obviously this is a, a risky thing to do because if you can stop the message being received then the box will have the entitlement forever without necessarily having paid for it it's unique addressing for the entitlement just one card or box so uh, where there's a, a common entitlement uh, it may be it may go to uh, a group address, but within that group address, individual bits will be used to show which of the uh, if there are two fifty six uh, boxes in that group to show which of those boxes should take account of the particular message. So it is uniquely delivered uh, as to what the entitlement is, uh, even though, uh, as I say, the, the group cuts down on the overhead of how many messages are required. Looking at the other end now, at the set-top box architecture, essentially what we've got is a receiver, uh, and from that receiver, uh, we strip out a single program transport stream. So typically in the multiplex that's coming from the broadcast end, there will be a number of transport streams, and historically that was often, in the early days, certainly often uh, eight or, or more complete, um, on a satellite link, eight or more complete transport streams. But obviously from the viewer's point of view, it's only one that you're trying to watch at a time. So a single transport stream, is stripped out, single program transport stream is stripped out and taken to the descrambler. The descrambler has to be loaded with the control words needed to descramble or decrypt the content. The descrambler runs the descrambler algorithm and delivers the descramble content back into the receiver, which then passes it on to the television for uh, viewing. So the conditional access subsystem is shown at the bottom here which runs the CA decryption algorithm, so to decrypt the ECMs and the EMMs, and it's often a smart card, and it holds keys securely and obtains and returns the control words to the rest of the set-top box. Hardware security may either be, may be one way of protecting those uh, secrets. Hardware security could be embedded in the set-top box, so there could be uh, a secure chip, and often the same chip as a descrambler, inside the set-top box. That's the way many of the US cable systems started. Uh, and what we see though in Europe is that the majority of uh, hardware security is based on a smart card, where you see a smart card that's plugged into the set-top box and the descrambler is a separate chip inside the set-top box. The key things about hardware security are they must be tamper-proof. As we'll see, um, trying to make them tamper-proof isn't as easy uh, or successful as it might be, but nevertheless, it does raise the threshold for piracy. The hardware security, uh, the secure hardware runs the CA decryption algorithms and provides a secure store for the various keys, uh, and has, has a unique and often a group address to permit filtering of EMMs, so that it only has to deal with the ones that are actually intended for it. Well, smart cards offer renewable security, but they're expensive. Um, you might say they're not as expensive as a complete set-top box, and that's quite true, but they are still relatively expensive. And there's a risk of the so-called McCormack hack. Uh, this was something that was realized in the early days of the uh, uh, Mac and then the uh, digital uh, systems that were being uh, used. With the smart card plugging into the set-top box, the control words pass across between the smart card and the, con the set-top box. And... In the early days, the control words were passed across in the clear. So we've got a control word that's changing perhaps every second or every 10 seconds, and the control word is 64 bits in length, so it's not a very large amount of data, so it's pretty easy to actually extract that data and to pass it around. So there's a risk of actually exposing 
uh, content by allowing people to transfer control words from one device to another and have multiple devices accessing the content without having to pay. This has been overcome in more modern uh, systems by having descrambler chips which themselves have secure storage for a number of keys and those keys are used to encrypt the transit content of the control words between the smart card and the set-top box. So either a common shared secret is used to allow the smart cards to communicate uh, with the descramblers or there's a pairing process in which case it's unique to the particular set-top box and card combination. The latter is much more secure, but the problem there is that when, and these things do fail, when the, these things fail eventually, replacing the smart card will be much more complicated because uh, it has a unique pairing with a set-top box, whereas if it's a common shared secret, it's much simpler because you can produce a new smart card still holding the same common secret uh, and deliver it back to the subscriber's home to replace the original one. So looking at the hardware security re renewal, we could replace the entire hardware unit, very expensive, but this is the way things had to be done with the early US cable boxes. And back in the, even in the early 1990s, people were talking about $50 truck rolls. So if we took you know, $50 to get to someone's home and change the receiver and a new receiver itself, new complete hardware unit may cost 50 or $100. So it's a very expensive process to replace, say a million of these things. The smart card, can be replaced, uh, much cheaper than replacing the whole box. But by the time you've got the logistics costs as well, you might be talking about something like $10 per card to replace, to get the card to the home. Various things can go wrong, and it puts quite a strain, uh, if the postal services are being used, puts quite a strain on postal services to try and send out a million or several million smart cards uh, quite uh, rapidly to make the change. Or we could load new software into the smart card, well, this is a bit tricky, and of course, it requires over air bandwidth to do it, and it means you have to have some keys which haven't been compromised uh, if you want to be able to do that. Otherwise, the pirates will just receive the new software at the same time as your paying subscribers, and the whole exercise will be quite pointless. Well, because of the costs of hardware, there's been a desire to move to software security. There are a number of techniques that can be used to protect secrets, and these have often come out of the gaming industry. And the difference with the gaming and the pay TV. Uh, requirements are that in gaming uh, often the issue is to try and protect the secrets for a limited period of time. I gather that most of the revenue from a new game is obtained uh, in the first six months and so the issues and the techniques that are used for protecting gaming software tend to be ones where it's difficult to actually break the system in the first place but once having broken it it may remain broken whereas in the case of pay tv of course we want it to be difficult to break and to remain difficult to break after we do whatever we have to do to recover the security. So the techniques that are used to try and protect the code are obfuscation uh, to try and make it hard to reverse engineer the code. This is where we move the code around in various odd ways. So instead of uh, going through in a nice, straightforward, easy to understand flow, uh, it's moved about with lots of uh, odd jumps in it. And obfuscation can either occur at the object code level but the object code is moved around in blocks or sections or at source code uh, and some systems may use both source and object code obfuscation to make it difficult to understand what's going on and reverse engineer the code. White box cryptography aims at uh, hiding keys within blocks of code and data. Uh, in the case of white box cryptography it's not really possible to begin to hide the information until you get to about 64 kilobytes or preferably a lot more than 64 kilobytes uh, of code and data and then you can begin to spread the information about inside it so it's no longer as easy to uh, abstract the key as it would be normally. For enhanced security there may also be a hardware root of trust uh, which can hold, uh, this will be typically be the descrambler chip which may provide a store for a small number of keys to protect particularly sensitive data in main memory. So although the whole thing's working in software, some of the information that's been received in the software is actually stored, encrypted in the main memory uh, of the receiver uh, using a local key that comes from the, the descrambler chip. Also to reduce the impact of a breach, there may be several versions of the software. So that if one version is broken, only part of the uh, base has to be uh, changed in order to recover. The security. 
Well, we've talked about a hardware um, rooted trust, but of course the problem is many over the top viewing devices have no secure hardware, or they may have secure hardware, but you haven't got access to it uh, because it's proprietary and linked to a particular manufactured revenue stream, uh, like some of the uh, items in, the, in Apple devices. Without two-way connectivity, with software security, there's no chance of knowing if a hack has occurred other than by seeing posts on the internet with people saying how clever they've been to break the system. But at least the, since the control words aren't exposed, uh, it's not possible to go in for the simplest McCormack hack and just transfer the control words around from device to, to device. To renew the, the uh, software, uh, then it means having to replace the software, ideally with multiple versions across different devices. Um, you could just deauthorize this type of unit, of course, and replace them all, but that takes you into a hardware change and it's very unpopular. So if, for instance, you found there was a problem with using a particular type of uh, tablet, uh, you certainly wouldn't get much uh, enthusiasm from viewers if every tablet of that type was to be deauthorized. So it does mean having to really find a way of getting a new version of the software that can be downloaded into the device uh, and to replace the compromised version. There are also cardless systems about today now, uh, and these, this is a variety of software systems, and this is based on the idea that there is reliable two-way communication between the head end of the broad, uh, broadcast from the set-top box. The descramblers scramblers provide a hardware route of trust, and point-to-point -point delivery is used to get keys to each set-top box. So each set-top box holds just the keys it needs for the next few hours of operation normally. Control words, so we've still got the ECMs in the transport stream. The control words aren't exposed because everything's being done internally in the set-top box in the receiver. And if the, if the system fails, if the two-way connection fails, uh, then the device will carry on working for several hours because it has several hours worth of keys. If the device is compromised, then all that's being exposed are the keys for the current and near future. If the system is broken, it can be uh, restored in the same way as a software system, or in the case of a severe compromise, there's usually a slot for a smart card or a USB uh, device to go in to go to a hardware-based system. So here's our view of a cardless security system. We have the D-Scrambler with the hardware root of trust, software running all of the smart card and conditional access subsystems. Uh, and in the event of compromise, we can replace the software or if need be, insert a smart card or complete conditional access subsystem using a USB uh, key or a PCMCIA card, which we'll look at in the moment as a common interface card. So common interface and common interface plus modules, these have the same form factor as the 1990s PCMCIA card that was used uh, in PCs. They've often now been replaced functionally by a USB stick, uh, but there's still a requirement for most televisions to have a CI interfaces in them. A smart card plugs into the module or the whole functionality maybe in a USB stick and then the CI module, conditional access module, plugs directly into the television. The conditional access module essentially replaces the whole set-top box. There was a problem with the first release of the specification that the video wasn't encrypted coming out of the module. CI plus adds encryption between the module and the television and some other features such as IP connectivity so that it's possible to get IP data into the CI plus module. They've not been so popular with the number of broadcasters, pay TV broadcasters, because of the fact that the user interface is now defined by the TV manufacturer rather than the broadcaster. In the case of the broadcaster, normally with their own set-top box, that defines the look and feel of the way the user interacts with their content. Now the look and feel with the CI module, look and feel is defined by the way the television uh, renders whatever data comes from the CI module. So it moves some of the control of the presentation and so on away from the broadcaster. Uh, and so some broadcasters have uh, a dislike of this approach, whereas others have viewed it as quite a useful way of moving some of the cost uh, from them where they're pr providing their own set-top boxes onto the viewer, where the viewer is perhaps buying a CI or CI plus module. So a quick recap about security renewal. With an embedded conditional access subsystem, it's very difficult to swap elements of the hardware. So you might need to swap the whole set-top box, which is very expensive. Conventional card-based system, we can exchange the smart card, which is less expensive, but still a lot of logistics and still quite expensive. 
We may be able to download new software into the conditional access subsystem, either an embedded one or a smart card, but we need great care or else this provides just another attack route for the pirates. And of course, the keys that are used for this download must be ones that haven't been compromised by the pirates. With software security, we need to develop and download new diverse software engine images. And there's been a tendency to underestimate the time and effort. The uh, perennial issue, oh, it's just software. Well, it is just software. Uh, and of course, with just software, as soon as you make a few changes to some complex code, you've got quite a high probability of introducing new errors. So there's a lot of effort involved. And there's not been much experience yet of recovering software-based systems. So it'll be interesting to see as time goes on uh, just what sort of problems really emerge. With cardless systems, we need to download new software or replace some or all of the internal system with a plug-in smart card or CAS. Then to try and move one step further beyond this, in the US and some other territories, there's been an interest in having uh, common core hardware into which specific keys and different encryption algorithms could be loaded, the so-called downloadable conditional access. So with our common hardware, to change from one broadcaster or cable operator, all we'd need to do will be to download the new software and keys to replace the original ones. However, there are some really big concerns, not to do with the technology, which is straightforward enough, but to do with actually uh, who takes responsibility. So one supplier makes the descrambler, the router trust, another one makes the rest of the CA hardware, a third one provides the software algorithms and keys for the first CA system, a fourth one provides the software algorithms and keys for the second CA system, the one we're gonna to change to, and a trusted third party holds the root keys needed to download the CA system when we go from CA system one to CA system two. So yes, this can all work, but of course, when it goes wrong, who is actually going to pick up the tab and sort out the problems? So the problems about who's going to take responsibility for sorting out any issues means that really this, although it's a good, good idea, this hasn't actually got any traction or got anywhere in terms of uh, implementation and use. And then we need to go from the set-top box to the television, where we've got the HDMI cable, and content across that link is protected by uh, high definition content protection or HDCP 2.2 for UHD content. But this has, has to be common to the box and the television. So keys have to be preloaded into both devices at the time of manufacture. So there's lots of time for parts to extract the keys and compromise the security. At least though, the video is decompressed at this stage. So the problem of handling so much data is a lot greater uh, and the pirate would have to recompress if they were to take this uh, as the uh, output that they're going to deliver. In theory, we can revoke the devices, uh, and it is very much in theory, and we'll see a bit more about this later. Well, interoperability, we talked earlier about the fact that the ECMs and the EMMs are encrypted using proprietary algorithms. So if we want to change, if we want to have uh, the same content available to a number of uh, different viewers who may be subscribing uh, in, to different, uh, broad, to different uh, broadcasters or different, using different CA systems. How can we do that? Well, one way is so-called multi-crypt, where we have interchangeable receiver hardware. For instance, having CI or CI plus modules plugged into the television or basic set-top box. This started to be used a bit in the, uh, in the 1990s and the Mac days, but it's not really uh, been very popular because of the cost of the uh, interchangeable hardware. We may use, a common use the fact that we've got a common scr scrambling algorithm uh, in the DVB case CSA or AES for ATSC. And so what we can do is we've got the uh, content stream, which has been encrypted, use, scrambled using the common algorithm. And so we can have two sets of ECM streams and two sets of EMM streams to provide the CA data to two different sets of set-top boxes. Uh, and they will be able to receive the same content because each could extract their own ECMs uh, and use that uh, common control word data from that in order to decrypt the content stream and to watch the content. Although this could provide uh, a mechanism for having two different broadcasters delivering access to the same content, in practice this hasn't happened. Where Simulcrit has been very widely used, it's been to migrate between different CA systems. So where one CA system has been compromised, uh, the new CA system can be rolled out and for a while the two systems can be run in Simulcrit so both viewers with the old system and viewers with the new can access the content, but then you need to turn off the old system because security obviously is limited by the least secure of the CA systems providing access to that content.
And then, as I mentioned, we can revoke devices. So uh, devices implementing HDCP are required to support revocation, as are CI plus modules and the televisions that they're connected to. So, for instance, if one specific model of, say, a Blu-ray player had a security compromise, a message can be broadcast that will disable all devices of that type. Well, this functionality has been designed in and has been required, but in practice, I don't think it's ever been implemented, ever been used, uh, and I can't imagine it ever being used because having bought a Blu-ray player, you're not going to be very pleased if a, one of your broadcasters uh, actually delivers a message to it, uh, which kills the thing. So the practice uh, of actually revoking devices uh, is a theoretical one, but not one that I can imagine ever being applied because the impact will be on blameless consumers uh, and they will be paying the price for uh, piracy that's occurred because of poor design, or because of ways pirates have got inside the devices. So it's there in theory, but not really something that is ever likely to be used. We can also um, protect uh, content by fingerprinting. For conventional uh, CA, there's one meaning of fingerprinting. We can get the unique address of the conditional access subsystem associated with the video being watched. We send a globally addressed EMM to all of the devices and they all dev display their unique fingerprint, their unique address. So this is software in the set-top box. It's not very secure, uh, but it does mean that uh, when someone's using a domestic subscription for public viewing, it's possible to send this message and up pops the unique ID, the address of the device uh, on the screen. And so if uh, in a bar somewhere, somebody's using a domestic subscription to view sports content there, it's possible to find which subscription is being used and then to turn that, uh, turn that off. But it's not really any uh, significant protection against illegal content sharing. This is really just to look for people who are uh, trying to uh, uh, avoid paying correct subscription, but still are paying a subscription. We can then watermark to track content. So with watermarking, we insert data into an image. So if you know it's there, you can find it and read it, but it's designed to be invisible. Now looking at a password, of course, a lot of the watermarking is quite visible, but with really good watermarking, uh, it's not going to be visible. It's a form of steganography or data hiding. With really good watermarking, the, the data will still be there even if the image is copied, for example, printed. One of the problems has been that historically a lot of processing power was required to create and insert watermarks. So it's only the central systems, the head end, the broadcast sites and so on that could do it. But it's now possible to incorporate watermarking functionality into secure parts of the set-top box conditional access subsystem. So the sp box specific watermarks can be inserted. And one of the ways this can be done is by actually having uh, multiple different, uh, marginally different uh, video uh, data packets uh, and choosing which one to use to incorporate in the image that's being put up according to the uh, unique address of the particular CA system. So depending what the address is of that box, uh, you'll get a very, very slightly different uh, image that appears on screen and then it's possible to work out uh, where that content has come from in the event of it being shared illegally. Well, looking at uh, piracy, we've talked about illegal issues. What have the sort of piracy issues been? Uh, been quite an interesting uh, trail of things that have happened. Going from the late 1980s in the United States, uh, Video Cipher from General Instrument, which was the first of the systems based on uh, digital encryption. In this case, the uh, video was still in the clear, but the audio was digital and encrypted. There was uh, embedded conditional access in the box. Rather stupidly, the very first boxes had an external line to say, was the device entitled or not to view uh, the content? So Power just tied that line true. Well, they moved away from that to a single chip. And then it turned out that single chip had faulty test mode, so it's possible to extract the keys uh, and or put in messages to give additional entitlements, which led to musketeering, where you could pay for a cheap service and get all of them. So all for one and one for all. Eventually, this was fixed by redesigning the chip and swapping all the set-top boxes. The interesting thing here is the cryptography was never broken. This was using DES to encrypt. Cryptography was never broken. The pirates broke the system by actually finding ways to ignore the cryptography. In the 1990s in Scandinavia, Filmnet and others were using um, early chip and pin bank cards. These turned out to have faulty test modes that allowed key and code discovery. Pick. Uh, single chip devices were used to produce pirate cards. 
countermeasures were painfully slow and expensive for broadcast at that time because of the limited nature of the cards and it was possible to change the keys of the card but it took a lot of effort about nine messages per card to change the key and it turned out that changing the keys just delivered a new uh, revenue stream for the pirates because the key would change the pirate would say to their pirate viewers ah that nasty broadcaster has changed the key never mind pay us some more money and we'll update your card and then eventually the pirate cards appeared with switches on them so that when the new key appeared uh, it could be put up on a bulletin board uh, and viewers would just set the new key into their card and carry on viewing but again because this was due to poor security in the chip uh, it, it was never a cryptographic problem. This is a problem with the security of the so-called uh, tamper-proof device. In the 1990s in the UK, the Sky Analog PAL service, which had been designed by people with a background in uh, security in the Middle East, in fact turned out to be really insecure. The very earliest ones used negative addressing, so if EMMs were blocked once an entitlement had been granted, they the cards remained entitled forever. Also, they use an external uh, 18 volt supply for the EEPROM programming. So if that was disconnected, it wasn't possible to change any of the contents of the card. So once an entitlement had been granted, it was there forever. There were various fixes moving to a positive addressing and internal charge pumps and uh, EEPROM in place of EEPROM. After many, many card shops, uh, the uh, system was more secure. But the cryptography was never broken. Again, these are all implementation uh, errors of one kind or another. In the 2000s in Central Europe, uh, the next generation of secure chip, this turned out to be uh, attacked through a side channel attack. Side channel is where you use some other feature, differential timing, um, differential power analysis to work out what's going on inside the chip. And due to poor design of the software, the 64-bit key was tested as eight lots of 8-bit operations. And it was possible by looking at what was going, the, the timing of what was happening in the chip, to work out what was going on. So you could see whether a particular eight bit was correct as the key, looking at the timing of how long it took to process that eight bit. And so you had eight eight bit operations. So using brute force, you could find the correct value of each eight bits of the key with no more than 256 attempts. Uh, and you did that eight times and you had the whole 64 bit key. Then there was another error in that same card that allowed any key to be used for an unlimited duration initial free entitlement. And that meant that in the course of a few minutes, it was possible to grant an unlimited duration entitlement to a card. So this was fixed by swapping out the cards for ones that had corrected software in them. But again, the cryptography was never broken. This was more design errors. Design errors closer to the cryptography, it's true, but design errors nevertheless. The core cryptography was never broken. Then in 2000s in Western Europe, the uh, chips, so-called secure chips, turned out to have 40 test modes and special cases which allowed code and key extraction. Clones, pirate cards were produced, and then even worse than that, it turned out to be possible to reprogram the original cards, so-called modified original smart card, mosking. Uh, so it meant that every valid card out there could be turned into a pirate device. Card swap was the only way to recover, but core cryptography, again, was never broken. Well, where are we now in terms of uh, piracy? More recently, we've had control word or card sharing. This is the McCormack hack. Because of the exposed card set-top box interface, it's possible to deliver the control word data to other devices. But at least the limitation on the piracy is you can only actually pirate the service where it's received. So it's only within the footprint of a satellite or in the area where there's terrestrial being broadcast being received or on a cable network that is possible to actually pirate the content. And the countermeasure here is to identify to, uh, which where the uh, uh, where the control words coming from uh, and the identify the uh, server and get it shut down. The fix to this is to encrypt the interface between the set-top box and the card but of course just like the issue about uh, Simulcrypt, where you only actually turn off the piracy when you turn off the uh, the old system. Uh, in the case of this, you only get over this problem once you deauthorize all of the units and cards which have an exposed uh, interface. So this has sidestepped the core cryptography. Again, there's not actually any break of the cryptography. And now the place where we are now is actually content sharing. Because we've got high bandwidth internet connections, you can share not just control words, but the actual content. And of course, the 
problem here is that it means that the piracy is not limited to the footprint of a satellite, but you can actually see the piracy content anywhere worldwide. The amount of bandwidth that's needed isn't uh, excessive, considering what we've got available now. And recently at IBC, uh, there was a stack of 50 so-called set-top boxes, or boxes suitable for loading software to access this pirated shared content, these so-called Kodi boxes. Uh, Kodi software can run on most Android devices. Kodi itself is quite legal. It's a number of sites uh, that provide access to the content uh, and provide add-ons to the base Kodi software. So it's quite difficult to fight it. And in a survey, uh, something like 6% of US households had Kodi boxes enabled to access pirated content. Countermeasures are difficult. Watermarking may enable you to locate the source of the content, uh, but then you need to trace the servers and take legal action to find operators and shut down the servers. So this means quite a lot of cooperation between law enforcement agencies, many of whom now are supported financially uh, by broadcasters and technology companies, uh, together with the, uh, uh, so across a variety of countries, because obviously this is an international problem. So what are the lessons to be learned from this? Well, when there are millions of devices in use, really low probability events will happen depressingly frequently. In fact, almost as soon as you can imagine something may go wrong, you'll probably hear that it has gone wrong. Uh, it's really quite depressing this at times, but nevertheless, uh, in any mass market, this is going to be the sort of issue. Don't assume any system will remain secure. Uh, I can think of some hardware manufacturers in the past providing CA systems who said wistfully, well, we didn't think it would be broken. Well, this is a naive attitude. From the start, it's essential to think the system will be broken, and when it is broken, how will you recover from the piracy when it occurs? Hackers are resourceful, and equipment out in the field, of course, is always lagging between behind what hackers have. Hackers have the latest equipment available, the latest technology. The set-top box out in the field may be five years old, and the law may be difficult to bear. Law, uh, law enforcement agencies uh, aren't always that interested in following some of these things up, uh, and uh, it may take a long time to uh, to do something. Setting up a pirate site is a very rapid activity. Shutting it down can take a lot longer. Getting in touch uh, with people hosting pirate sites on their terms of use can take something like uh, a week or more to get them to admit that their terms of use are being breached. They then shut the site down. Uh, and about an hour later, the site is back up again in another location. If subscribers think they can get something for nothing, then they're part of the attack. Uh, so the home is a very hostile environment. This is why the technology that was used for bank cards proved so insecure when used for pay TV. With bank cards, people don't really have any desire to have their bank account compromised, but they're very happy to see their television service compromised because they view it as being able to get something for nothing. And as we've seen, it's not a cryptographic problem, but rather it's a flawed implementation. So there's a lot of emphasis on the cryptography, but actually what needs to be is an emphasis on good engineering uh, and engineering for reliability and renewability, uh, as opposed to thinking that all the problems can be dumped in the lap of strong cryptography. It's not that at all. Well, thank you for your time uh, this morning. And... Uh, you're very welcome to join the IET Media Group on LinkedIn to learn more about uh, this and other uh, technologies related to uh, media deployment, media access, media viewing. We look very much to seeing you on the next media from uh, uh, video from IET Media. And once again, thank you for your time.